Welcome Julie, thank you very much for exhibiting here at Timeless Textiles again. Thanks Sam, it's a pleasure to be here. So this is very different, this body of work, from the first um, exhibition you had which was primarily about um, citrus fermentation on silk. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the exhibition and the techniques and processes you've used. Sure. Well, actually, it's not so very far away from that last exhibition I had with you, which was about fruit fermentation onto fabrics, because so many people ask me what other colours does that work come in, that it forced me to have a look at the technique of fermenting fruit and um, bacteria and moulds onto fabrics. So, I went back and did my masters at ANU in 2003. And while I was investigating that work through um, ANU textiles and the botanical and zoology department, growing my own bacteria. As you do. As you would. <laughs> um, to see if we could get different colors, mm. we realized that you could, but I couldn't actually do that in that laboratory because some of the bacteria that produce colours are quite harmful. So uh, that ultimately led to looking at my fabrics down a scanning electron microscope. And that magnifies things at um, enormous magnification. The scanning electron microscope uses electrons instead of light so that when you coat your sample in gold as you must to let the electrons bounce off the object to then come up with an image it is all in black and white so i said to dr roger hetty who i was working with at rsbs but where's the color and he goes what do you mean? I said, I've seen in books, there's lots of colours. And he said, no, you have to learn Photoshop to do that. And so then I had to learn Photoshop. So actually, this body of work is stem, stemming directly from that. Because in this work, for example, you see highly magnified images and some macro images of different things. For example, this has got... Um, opium poppy heads in it. It's got um, a part of an insect from when I did uh, a residency at CSIRO Entomology. It's got Fossombronia spores from when I did a residency at the Botanic Gardens. So they're all highly magnified images of plants and animals that I have all put together to form my own genetically modified plants, really. And they would be in black and white if I hadn't learned Photoshop and learned how to put the colour in. And from these um, series of works, I then went on to the rest of the work that's in the exhibition, uh, which is a different technique, but looking at colour more closely and how we, we anticipate colour, how we perceive colour, how size and shape and juxtaposition of colour alter our perception of an object. It's a bit like an illusion, isn't it? Yes. So, for example, in these pieces here, which are not made using scanning electron micrographs and digital printing, uh, they were still inspired because looking at putting colour in made me think about how is colour perceived, what happens when you alter shape and what is our perception of colour. And then as a textile printer and a dyer, what made me uh, interested was the fact that a particular technique called chemical resist as in the techniques I'm using here, uh, are using a technique that uses two different classes of dyes, a VAT dye and a reactive dye, so that when you put the two dyes together, one of them resists the other, so that you can get, for example, red onto green or orange onto pink without the background coming through. 
So most textile um, lovers will know that dyes are like a watercolour. If you put red and green together, they'll just go muddy. If you put their opposites, their complementary opposites together, you'll get brown or grey. So as you can see from these textiles, I don't get brown or grey and they're printed exactly on top of each other. So there's no colour separations involved. I have used screens to get some of the more intricate designs, but the backgrounds are all hand um, dyed over the top and you can see that um, the colour has resisted itself. So it took a long time for me to perfect this technique and to work out which colours worked and which dyes didn't. And it's a very laborious job, um, which is why nobody really does it um, uh, as a practitioner, because really now we have digital printing. If you wanted to get this type of work done, you would just digitally print. But what I really love is always the mark of the hand and the mark that is not a perfect repeat the little marks that you can see where I've been squeegeeing the color on and I've run out of color and I've had to quickly put it on the marks where something isn't quite so perfect but it's enabled me to extend beyond what I thought the piece would be into becoming something completely different or adding a different element into the design. And it's harder to capture these colours on cotton? It is much harder to capture full-on colour on cotton because of the um, mordanting that's usually needed for cotton. But with this process, you can see you can get really vibrant colours. Um, silk and wool as protein fibres are really easy to get colour on and I think having mastered those and actually even in my natural dyeing I have always said to myself I love silk and wool they're so beautiful blah blah and I wouldn't think about cotton because it was actually too hard but then I think it's a challenge it's a challenge to be able to do something onto cotton because when I did a residency in Malaysia, I realised how beautiful cotton was to wear. Um, it's a beautiful fibre. I don't necessarily think we should be growing it in this country, but there is a lot of cotton out there. And I think if you can get the effects you want, either through natural dyes or synthetic dyes, then it's more usable. I think it's incredible that in this room where you've got eight different lengths of cotton, you've said that you've used the same dye, mm. same colours. Yeah, I worked out in my masters which colours uh, would work best and which ones would resist the others. And I made up batches. I, um, as I do with all my work really, I make sure I take down the recipe so that I can reproduce the colours. But when I did these lengths, even though they were done over several days, uh, I made up enough dye. So it's incredible to look at one piece of fabric and say they're the same colours as those ones. You, you, you kind of don't believe it, but it is actually true. No, the greens look totally different. Yeah. That you've used in different lengths. Yeah, yeah. And yet sometimes that's because of what I've put on the top, for example, in that green, I've put little tiny yellow dots on the top, or um, I've put these two over here with the oranges, they're exactly the same colors, but you perceive them differently because of size of image, placement of image, whether it's um, horizontal pattern or uh, whether it's a vertical pattern, um, whether there's detail in there that makes your eye kind of fuzzy or whether you're seeing halo images. So with, the so with these circular works on the wall, um, what I wanted to capture was that all the fabrics are done with this chemical resist technique. But I wanted people, viewers, to get that feeling of me looking down that microscope, mm. even though you don't look down a scanning electron. 
manipulate on a microscope. You, everything's presented on a computer screen. Um, I get a lot of inspiration by looking down the microscope at, at different things in the course of my artwork. So I wanted these to be like circles of life, like patterns you would find in nature, but highly amplified with embroidery and buttons and different patterns. So I wanted them to kind of meander across the wall like some sort of um, biota of life that was starting and flowing on and then coming back again. So clearly science has had a huge impact and informed your work over the years. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, because I started my career in science in a veterinary laboratory way back when I was 18, um, I never thought that I would go, that would provide uh, the amount of inspiration it has to my artwork, but now I find that after so many solo exhibitions I'm always looking to nature and science as muse, especially um, plants, yeah. You've spent quite a lot of residencies looking at a whole range of things mm. over the last probably decade mm. that I'm aware of. Where's your interest lying at the moment? So actually at the National Museum of Australia I'm looking at their botanical holdings. Most people don't realise that the museum only displays about 5% of its collection and they have these huge repositories of all the artworks that you may never get to see. Some people don't understand why you would collect and not show, but a lot of these things are quite fragile. But they're extremely important in terms of um, social uh, history and history of um, colonisation and pre-colonisation of Australia, of, of geology, of a whole lot of different Things. So I'm looking at some books in particular, the seaweed albums that were collected in the 1800s, 1836 and 1870, no, 1854 to 1882 to be precise. And the reason why they've captured my interest is because little is known about their provenance and about that um, passion that inspired so many women, unknown women and women of the Victorian era to go down to the beach and start collecting. And collecting seaweeds was something that they could do, it freed them up from the house, it got them out into the fresh air and that was... And it was started. acceptable I imagine. That's right. Mm. It was, you didn't have to be heavily chaperoned, it was out in the public. but. You, you could free yourself up and in fact it started changing fashion so that fashion even became a lot looser because it was deemed acceptable for women to get good exercise. So that's my current obsession at the moment and I'm sure it will be informing some artwork that will come with that from next year. So I'm really grateful to the museum for um, supporting me to have a residency there but also to the Australia Council who I obtained funding from for some personal and professional development. And as a child did you have a interest passion around fibre art or did it just start to grow no, for you? I hated <laughs> fibre I couldn't sew, I was always failing at sewing. It, I hated my mother sewing for me. There was nothing really about textiles that I particularly had any interest in. I was taught to crochet when I was about five or six. Um, I can remember that, um, but no, not really. I was always a bit messy. Because your ability to stitch into cloths that I've seen, that clearly would have taken you months to stitch into, yeah. Did that just come along for you as you Yeah, pretty much. And I think I have to be really invested in a project. And once I am, I just don't stop. I just 
continue on and on and on. Whether it's research or whether it's doing a technique, there's no, you can't say, oh, I can't say, oh, that will do. No one will know. It has to be complete for me. And do you have um, thoughts about where your life might take you in terms of textiles in the next, say, five years, Julie? Really? Not really. I quite enjoy doing residencies mm -hmm. and the opportunity that they provide for new research. Um, all my exhibitions are not one-off pieces that are then exhibited together. They all have kind of a relationship together. So. I look at my work in terms of installation more than as one of saleable mm. objects. And so for me, I guess it would be to get my work out to the wider community. Mm. Um, I have exhibited in solo exhibitions and group exhibitions overseas, so I quite enjoy doing that. Mm. But I think the most important thing is to keep interested mm -hmm. and to keep enjoying what I do, otherwise it becomes a chore. Thank you so very much for showing your great love of colour that's on these walls and congratulations on this exhibition. Thanks, Sam. Thank you.